All right. So welcome to the um, final afternoon. I'm very happy we have uh, DJ who's going to talk about uh, MTY and So, um, hi, Mark. Um, thank you all for coming, and uh, a big thanks to Simons for uh, giving a big boost to our field. And, uh, uh, it's really a privilege to have such a wonderful resource you know, for CS and Econ and other fields. So, okay. so I'm going to talk about, uh, uh, is the volume okay? Yeah. So I'm going to talk about the core, which is, which is a quintessential uh, solution concept in economics as well as game theory. Um, it was defined, uh, an early version uh, with a different name was defined by Edgeworth in the 19th century in the context of general equilibrium theory. And then in 59, it was ported to cooperative game theory by Giles. And there its status grew year after year, I guess, more or less, or maybe at least decade after decade. And uh, LP duality theory has been used all the way from the beginning till now. And uh, uh, in the context of this book, I started looking at this more carefully. And uh, I could find many gaps remaining, more than one, let's say. And that's what I want to talk about today. What are the gaps and how somebody can fill them? So um, I'm not giving any definitions for a while. Uh, I think in the style of Al Roth. Uh, keep it without symbols for as long as possible. Uh, so so I, just a high level uh, picture here. Um, so this is the famous Bondareva the Shepley theorem. It was proved independently by Olga Bondareva in the Soviet Union, then the Soviet Union and Lloyd Shepley in the US um, around the same time. Actually, Bondareva did it earlier. Um, and you know that in those in that era, there used to be key results that would be proved on both sides of the iron curtain quite independently and almost at the same time, I guess because the time was ripe for the result. So, so many of those. So what it says is that a game has a non-empty core, even if and only if it is balanced. I'm not even going to define balanced. I haven't defined the core. I know. Don't worry about it. Non-empty, of course, everybody knows. And that's a very key property about a game to a certain whether or not a game has an empty core. Um, and its proof is uh, follows from Farquhar's lemma, namely LP duality. And uh, this condition of balancedness involves all subsets of agents, so exponentially many subsets, and therefore exponentially many variables in the LP. And so the LP is humongous. And uh, that by itself is not a showstopper to good algorithms, but on top of that, it has it is structureless. So for instance, non-bipartite matching, Edmund's LP has exponentially many constraints, one for every odd set. But you can solve it using ellipsoid, you can solve it combinatorially very, very fast. But here, as far as I know, this theorem, which is a key theorem, because it ascertains something very key about the core, namely non-emptiness of the core, has no algorithms around it. It never got used in an algorithm. Okay, because of this, 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 this mess, this mess that it, 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 it involves exponentially many variables. On the other hand, uh, Shepley Schubik did study the core the right way using LP duality. And there's this considered really a classic paper. Um, probably most economists, I think I've never met an economist who didn't put it in their top few papers. I hope I never do. <laughs> Uh, so that, I mean, top few papers might include Nash equilibrium, market equilibrium, and this, and maybe a few more. So I'm going to start by deconstructing this result before constructing something new around these notions. Okay, so, and again, I'm not going to give any definitions for a while, for quite a while. Uh, and we'll just do fun and games. And uh, importantly, uh, you're welcome to stop me anytime and ask any questions or make any comments. And uh, I know I have 45 minutes, but it'll we have time. Okay, so so here's a um, a tennis club, which has some rather famous uh, players, 
and uh, there are women players and men players, and each edge means that they can uh, form a team and enter into a tournament that's about to happen. And these are the expected winnings of each team if they enter the tournament. And uh, <coughs> of course, the, the tennis club, for its own survival, would like to put in a bunch of teams that maximize the earnings. And that can be done by picking, picking uh, teams that maximize, uh, maximize the weight of the matching formed. And that would be these two teams, the two green teams, because then the earnings would be $250, so, uh, $220. Also, you can, you can uh, please question my arithmetic because it's, not, it's quite weak. Okay, so, uh, so, so how to distribute this profit of $220, right? And I've already flashed this slide that it, a fair solution would be to equally divide it. And of course, nobody is happy with this. Even Chris Ebert is not happy because you know it hurts her pride to get uh, free money. So what should we do? Any alternatives? Well, let's see what, what, what we should do. There are alternatives, they are not very good. And I would put them all under the uh, heading of uh, naive fair solutions. We don't want to go there. We want some really sophisticated fair solutions for profit sharing. Okay. And we'll do it via a negotiation-based process. Because these are probably the most competitive people on this planet. And each of think them thinks they are the best player ever and should get the entire profit, right? So they should fight it out. That's the only way to get to a real solution. And that's, that's a, not a naive solution, okay? So it should be a negotiation-based process. And uh, this is too complicated an example, so we have to start somewhere simple. And here, we have uh, two possible teams, uh, and $100 can be made, whether we enter the green team or the black team. And let's say we enter the green team. And how are you going to share the profit of the green team, right? Between uh, Serena and Bjorn Borg. OK, so Borg says, well, I was by far the best player in the era of wooden rackets. I should get the whole profit. And Serena says, look, I know I've retired now, but I was the best woman player for two decades. And, uh, and if you're not happy with zero dollars, go sit on the sideline, and Jimmy Connors will come and play with me. Okay. And indeed, she gets the whole profit, and these guys get zero profit. The reason being that she's good, of course, and the men have no alternatives. She has alternatives. If you have alternatives, you can negotiate. If you have no alternatives, you take what you get. OK, let's go to a, a oh. Then Connors ups his team, his game. And now with Serena, they can make $110. How should they divide the profit? And Connors said, look, I have been really working hard. Give me half the profit at least. We have made more money. And she says, well, take $10. Otherwise, I'm going to play with Borg, who's sitting on the sideline. And that's how the profits get divided. OK. So let's, I mean, these are two simple examples. So uh, again, the same reason. Um, so now we have a bit more complex situation. And we can have two, kind, two, two ways of uh, entering teams with maximum weight matching, either the black teams or the green teams, and both give equal uh, profit to the, to the tennis club. And suppose we enter the green teams. So Serena plays with uh, John McEnroe, and Martina plays with Jimmy Connors. And here, you can see that uh, by far the best player is McEnroe, right? No matter who he plays with, he makes $110. Um, and you probably know how he wins so much money. Uh, he always screams at the referees, and uh, and you know they give him the points. But that's besides the point. The point is, he makes money. He should get profits. And uh, if he asks for lots of profit, William says, OK, go sit on the sideline. I can easily make $100 playing with Borg, who, who will get Epsilon. And so the profit of 100, 210 again gets divided in a very lopsided way. That's the only way to do it, a uh, negotiation-based process. So what's going on here? OK. And this time, of course, McEnroe has alternatives. So you thought alternatives are good. 
but his his alternatives are are uh, uh, not as good as as the positional advantage that Serena and Martina have because they have players sitting there waiting to to play with her for zero dollars, right? So so there's a lot going on here, and uh, and if you want to analyze this game, oh my God, it'll be it'll be a big mess. So let's put in some uh, real systematic uh, uh, solution concept here to get to these kinds of nice uh, uh, ways of allocating profit. And uh, so this is the assignment game, the classic work of uh, Shapley and Shubik. And the underlying mathematical structure is that there's a bipartite graph. Uh, these are the women players, the men players, and the teams, and the profits of, the, of each team, right? And the grand coalition, of course, is uh, all the players. Mm -hmm. These are all possible teams. And W is the expected earning of a team. And, and the profit of the whole game, which is called the worth of the game, is the, is the max weight matching in this, in this graph. And the question is how to distribute the worth. And, and that's what brings me to this topic of profit sharing, which is uh, really a central uh, concern ever since humanity became somewhat intelligent. So, and, and, and the proof of that lies in this uh, amazing paper of uh, Oman and Mashler. Uh, okay. uh, so, so bankruptcy problem from the Talmud, and what is that? So there's an incident from this Babylonian Talmud from 500 BC. Um, so there's this man who has three wives. Um, apparently it was allowed then. Um, and uh, uh, he is going to. He is trying to promise uh, these wives some wealth after his death. Okay. Now um, I don't know what currency they were using in the Babylonian old ancient Babylonian time, but you know my civilization is even older, so I'm going to use rupees. Okay. So let's say that he promises to these three wives 100, 200, and 300 rupees. Okay. Fair enough. Okay. So 100, 200, and 300 rupees. And, uh, and then if when he passes away, his estate is worth 100, 200, or 300 rupees, the question is, how much should each wife get? And the recommendation from the Babylonian Talmud is not one is to two is to three ratio, no. Basically, they, the, the, what they get turns out to be consistent with what's called the nuclear loss, which is also a solution concept for profit sharing. Inferior to core, core is the gold standard, Nucleolus has many problems. Uh, I don't want to go into that at all. So, so, but, 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 but I, I hope you realize. I mean, if if you don't share profit in a fair way, um, basically, um, loving siblings can stop talking. Friends can become enemies. Entire business collaborations can collapse, and you know nothing will get done. And uh, probably that was seen in the Congress recently. Uh, Nothing was done for three weeks. Okay, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't want to go into those issues here. Good morning. Uh, so, um, so the core, as I said, is the is the um, basic uh, the the gold standard for profit sharing, and it tries to make sure that the grand coalition remains intact. In what sense? In the sense that no sub coalition can generate more profit by itself. By itself, whatever the profit it can generate, right? And therefore, will not feel any need for, to secede, and therefore, the core, uh, the, therefore, the grand coalition remains intact. So let's define all of this stuff also properly. So a subcoalition will be some subset of uh, players, men and women, and the worth of a subcoalition is a weight of a max weight matching in the graph restricted to the players in S. And of course, the worth of the entire game is the the total profit. And an imputation is a way of sharing the worth among all the players, the worth of the game, of course, right? And what we want to do is make sure that every sub coalition gets at least as much money as it can make by the, itself. And that comes about like this, that an imputation is in the core. First of all, it, if it divides the total worth among the players and for every sub coalition, the amount of money obtained by the players in the sub coalition is at least the max weight matching in G restricted to S. Okay. So then the question arises, what kind of a fairness criterion does this way of sharing the profit satisfy? 
what is the fairness criteria? And obviously, it is fair to each of the exponentially many subcorrelations. That's what it is, right? But it has some drawbacks also. Beautiful and wonderful as it is, it has some drawbacks. For instance, in the assignment game, uh, the, an individual player, so a collation consisting of only um, one man or a one, one woman makes, can make zero money because you need an entire team to enter into the tournament. And so it makes no promises to individual players. Is that okay? Not really, and we'll see what can be done about that. Okay. Questions? Somebody had. No. Sorry, Somebody should have. Huh? Did you define the, the, the term fair? Yeah. Uh, whatever you think it is in English language. This 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 is the notion of fair, that that it gives to each subcorrelation as much money as it can make by itself, and that's the notion of fairness that, that it satisfies. Now I, I cannot unravel that more, but we can talk about it later. Okay, so uh, let's see what Shepley and Chubik did. Um, so they characterized the core of the assignment game. How? So they first wrote out the LP relaxation of the problem of finding a max weight matching in the underlying graph on the men and the women players. And this is, you know, it looks like a whole bunch of dirty symbols, but, but it's not very hard. It's quite easy, actually. So all you have is this is the weight which is the profit of a team, E. This is a, a, a variable corresponding to each, each team, E. And what it says is that the total, and, and these variables should take on values, non-negative values. They never have to take a value more than one because of these constraints. And these simply say that at each um, woman player and at each man player, at most one total edge should be incident when added over all the fractions. So this gives you a fractional matching and the amazing thing about this lp is that it always has an integral optimal solution so that's the real matching not a fractional matching anymore and that's that's okay i don't know how shapley and chubik chose this problem whether they reverse engineered to this or they started with this and realized that there was integrality and then went forward with that but but that's the magic in this lp and then they wrote out the dual so there's a variable y sub i for each of these inequalities, y sub j for each of these inequalities, and you're minimizing the sum of these y's. And this is the, the key point, that each, each team should get at least as, as much profit as it can generate by itself. Okay, so for each edge ij, the total profit of i and j is at least the weight of that edge. So it's a covering LP, this is a packing LP, um, non-negativity, nothing more. So, incredibly enough, if you make teams happy, you make every subcorrelation happy, and that's what the Shapley-Schubert theorem says. That that y is a core imputation if and only if it is an optimal dual solution. It's a very beautiful statement, right? I mean, complete characterization of the core, and that's not always. I mean, in fact, very rarely is it possible to completely characterize or even. Uh, and okay, so I'll say more. So, and the, and of course, LP duality theorem has to give the proof. And so the core is non-empty, so the game is balanced, but we don't care for that. And being non-empty, the core being non-empty is somewhat rare because exponentially many subcorrelations have to be happy. Okay. So, turns out these solutions that we got from negotiation are the unique imputations in the cores of these two games that I, that I gave. Unique imputations, okay? So there's some big power here going on. And uh, indeed, yes. from this it should be obvious that the core gives deep insights into negotiating power of individuals and subcorrelations. I'm not sure individuals in this case, but in general. Um, and the core is a convex polytope because it consists of all the optimal dual solutions. Uh, and I just showed you two examples where the core is, has only one point in it, but when it is non-unique, it has two very special imputations. One favors the women players and one favors the men players. Okay. And for instance, in this game, uh, Jimmy Connor got $10. This is the man optimal imputation. 
And that's the woman optimal imputation where Serena gets, in fact, all the money. And every com convex combination of these two is a core imputation, and that's it. That's the whole core in this game. Yeah. OK. So what is the underlying reason for these two extreme imputations? And I'm sure you will be recalling stable matching, and we'll come to that in a moment, because that also has two extreme solutions. So Shepley and Chubik showed that the set of code imputations form a distributive lattice. And the, the extreme imputations are the top and the bottom element of this lattice. Okay. And you know this, this uh, uh, setting of, uh, of assignment game turned out to be paradigmatic because you know the wonderful structural properties completely everything works out and that's of course a testament to matching and its wonderful structure which always amazes people um, and 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 in, in fact I, I showed it to you in the context of the of a very frivolous uh, tennis game but they give it in the context of a housing market game ah which is shown in the cover of this new book um, so this is somewhere close to my house in uh, Newport Beach, where they are trying to find out which is more valuable, a house or a rock. And in this case, the house turns out to be less valuable than the rock. Okay. And if you're thinking, if you're saying, hey, hey, you know, if you, uh, if you have any pity on me, that's not my house, okay? <laughs> Somebody else's house turns out to be like that. Uh, I don't know who, moreover. OK, but the point is that, uh, that uh, what the point I want to make is that this housing market game, however nice it is and however many applications it can have, simple ones, is, is a bit, oops, is a somewhat rudimentary. And we'll see how to fix that also. OK, so as far as I know, and you can correct me uh, at the end of the talk or maybe now, as far as I know, the core uh, the assignment game was uh, was studied by Shapley and Shubik. They started studying it, and they got essentially all the wonderful properties of this game. I don't. I haven't seen a single paper that comes to the level of this level of fundamental properties. I, but I might be mistaken, and you can correct me later or now. So, but still, we are allowed to ask this question, right? Do we really know it all? And let's see what we might know about the assignment game beyond what Shapley and Shupik did. So here's the question. Which players get profits? Which players get profits? Uh, can we characterize the set of players who get profits? OK, so let's, uh, let's try to attempt an answer. So I'm going to uh, classify players into three categories. Essential ones are matched in every match weight matching. Okay, they have to play. Viable ones are matched in some max weight matchings and not matched in some other max weight matchings. And subpar ones are never matched in max weight matchings. Okay, so which players get profits? Essential, viable, subpar, or essential and viable because each one of those plays at least once. I don't know if I should ask uh, such a high powered audience for answers, but if you want to venture an answer, please go ahead. Only this time. After this, I'll ask many questions and answer them myself. But just because it's the first question I'm asking. Subpar gets zero. Oh, okay, and who gets positive profits? Somebody else should answer that. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to take the risk. Ah, very smart. <laughs> okay, nobody wants to risk. I, I, I don't care. You know, I'm. Huh? Oh, really? Good. Okay. No, you're right. Okay. So, but what will give the answer? What we give the answer is the following uh, thought, that the worth of the game comes from an optimal solution to the primal LP. A core imputation comes from an optimal solution to the dual LP. What connects a primal optimal solution to a dual optimal solution? Multipliers. Huh? Complementary flatness conditions, we call it in computer science. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 for people in approximation algorithms, this is sort of uh, you know bread and butter. You wake up in the middle of the night and you'd be thinking about complementary flatness conditions. So surprising it is that nobody applied complementary flatness conditions to this for 60 years. But if you apply it, you get to this theorem that a player is paid in some core imputation if and only if it is essential. 
Sure. And uh, in other words, core imputations play only essential players, and every essential player gets in some core imputation. Okay. We'll use this. We'll use these facts in a moment. Okay. So, and then one can talk about teams and apply complementary slackness conditions to teams and all that, but that's not part of the, this talk. Okay, so let's now jump to stable matching, which is, has some analogous properties. Namely, it also has uh, these extreme solutions because of uh, because the set of uh, stable matching from the distributive lattice. The only difference is that this time it's a finite distributive lattice. That's not a small difference, as we'll see in a moment. And the Gail Shepley uh, deferred acceptions algorithm finds exactly these two solutions, nothing in the middle, depending on who proposes. And both of them are extreme solutions. They favor one side and disfavor the other side. And so you want to, you want to find more fair solutions. And a lot of work was done on that. Uh, yeah, a lot of work on, was done on that um, using Burkhoff's representation theorem for finite distributive lattices and the notion of rotations. So the Burkhoff representation theorem says that uh, corresponding to any finite distributive lattice, there's a partial order on some elements, such that the upper closed sets of that partial order, which by themselves form a lattice, these upper closed sets are isomorphic to elements inside the lattice. Okay. And in the case of uh, stable matching, the, the partial order, the elements on which the partial order is defined are the rotations. And there are at most n square rotations. So this is a succinct representation of the entire lattice, which may be exponentially large, but this particular partial order is on over only at most n square vertices elements. So using these rotations, you can go and, and this particular partial order, you can go from the top element to the bottom element, each time improving one side and, and, and decreasing the other side. And so somewhere in the middle, you might be able to find better, more fair uh, stable matchings and that and there are many results uh, giving those algorithms. So let's see what happens in the case of uh, core of the assignment game. Again, we have top and bottom element, and uh, these can be found using LP very easily. Um, can we find more fair core imputations? Problem, L is not finite. In fact, the core is very dense. Eh, not very dense, but it, it is dense. I don't know what very dense means. <laughs> so. So, <clears throat> the lattice is not finite. So, it was a distributive lattice, but not finite. So, uh, sorry, I drank it in a hurry. Um, and as a result, uh, Burkhoff's representation theorem doesn't hold. And so we need new methodology if we want to find somewhere, some, some core imputations that are more fair to both sides, right? So what can we do besides, right? What, what, is, what kind of new methodology can we throw at this issue? Is it clear what the issue is? Yeah. But in this case, have you told us how to get top and bottom? I, I told you some LP can do it. Yeah. Very easy. I mean, homework exercise. I mean, really, honestly, for you, you'll step out of it and, and get it on the way. Okay. So basically, we need new methodology if you want to find these more fair core imputations. Right? And I'll show you one way that I can do it, but I'm sure that many more things have to be done or should be done here. I hope, okay. Because it seems like the kind of thing that many more things need to be done. Okay, so first of all, how about getting a min-max fair core imputation, okay? So, so let CI be the set of all core imputations of instance I of uh, assignment game. Oop, 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 oop. And the min-max fair core imputation is the one that minimizes over all imputations, the maximum over all players of the amount of money the player gets. Minimize the maximum amount that any player gets. Okay. And lo and behold, there's a very easy LP that solves this. Namely, you first solve an LP to determine the worth of the game. That's one LP, the dual. 
and then alpha will be squished down from the top. Zero is here. We'll squish down alpha as much as possible and make sure that all players get at most alpha. And these, these two conditions ensure that this is a, an optimal dual because it has the right objective function value and the right uh, constraints on, on, on edges. And so we'll get a, yes, sir. So incentive compatibility is not, not an issue here, right? So if you have a one-sided assignment market. No, I'm not, uh, yeah. Lower prices in the core, then it would also be incentive compatible, but that is not a concern here. No, okay. not, not yet. I mean, I want to just uh, optimize the, the money money spent, money uh, profit given. But let's talk more. I, 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 I like where you're heading, but but it's for a longer discussion. Yeah, thank you for asking that. So. So, 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 yeah, we have non-negativity, and these two conditions ensure that this is a, uh, an optimal dual solution. And then upon that, we are minimizing alpha, so therefore we'll minimize the max, right? Okay, how about max min? Well, not, not that much far removed, because uh, we, we define that to be the one that, the core imputation that maximizes over all imputations in the core, the minimum amount that a player gets. And, Clearly, there's a similar LP that will do it. Right? Yes, it will do it, but will it do anything useful? That's the question. What do I mean by that? So this amount, the amount of money given to a player, the minimum amount of money that a player gets, can it be identical, identically zero so that the max of this min is zero and we get zero? It's a vacuous solution. Right. Could it be that? And the answer is yes, it could be. Because if there's a non-essential player, the, that player will get zero always in every core imputation. So the max of the min is zero. There's a player who always gets zero. So the minimum is always zero. So the max of the min is always zero. So you got nothing out of this solution. Right? So how do we fix it? Obviously. We should change it so that we only think about essential players because they get positive money and we minimize over only the essential players. And then we can write out an LP. But we want to still be careful, right? We, maybe, maybe, maybe no matter which core imputation I take, there's always an essential player who gets zero. Right? So if for every core imputation, there's always a, an essential player. Not, we know there could be a player who gets zero non-essential ones. But there could also be an essential player who always, for each core imputation, there's an essential player who gets zero, in which case this is still identically zero. How do we deal with that? So remember I said that each essential player gets in some core imputation. So for each essential player, pick that core imputation and take the, the convex combination of those core imputations that's still a core imputation and under that core imputation, every essential player gets non-zero amount. And therefore, this is not identically zero. So it's not vacuous. This, this, this notion is not vacuous. So therefore, we can also find max min. And that will be somewhere between the top and the bottom. Can we do more? Yes. Uh, oh, and, and it's an LP that's similar. I won't go there. So we can find an equitable core imputation. How do I define that? Yes, sir. In this, um, uh, if, if instead of selecting a player, you select a player at random. Oh, no, 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 no. No, you can get to the set of essential players. I'll tell you how. You know the worth of the game, right? You know the worth of the game? Now, pull out a player, find the worth of the remaining game. If it did not go out, go down, this is not essential. If it went down, then, then this is essential. So if you do that for each player, you got the set of essential players. Everything is polynomial time here. But what I mean is this what you're saying was also true of the min maximum. We didn't need to go there. We didn't need to go there. <laughs> There's an asymmetry here. Uh, there's a very subtle asymmetry. And that's the reason I stated that first. Because there we didn't even play at random, then there is We are not choosing any player at random. Sorry. No, we are not choosing anything at random. Uh, <clears throat> So your question is, why is min-max OK? OK. Um, oh, so why is min-max OK? And the reason is that 
these inequalities can be thrown in for for free, for free. They, and the, these will just squish, squish the the top element down. That's it. So so we don't need to. Essential players have no meaning, no extra meaning here. Essential players will have non-zero, but everybody will have at least zero, and therefore we are okay. Okay. It's an easy thought for later. Let's talk later. Yeah. Is it ever possible that the core is not unique? But of course. We are talking single uh, essential player uh, who gets the same $100 in every core. We saw that happen. Serena Williams was that player. Yeah, okay. But that if the core is unique and there's a single essential player, there's nothing to be found. There's no... That's why I'm saying it's not unique. But, uh, no, a single sure. player is getting $100 at all core locations, what would that find? Then? Sorry, it's, if the core is unique. It's not unique. How is it not unique? If a single player gets $100, everybody else gets zero. Which no, no, they get something. Mm. How do you mean there's some, something? Only essential players get something. So there are more essential players than that one person who's getting 100. Uh, maybe maybe I, 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 I... No, no, no. So, so think about it. Uh, the question was not well posed. Okay. The question is, uh, you always get $100, whatever core... Uh, Fine. I, I always get... I, but... In some uh, core locations, I get only 20. In other, some, in other core locations, I get only 50. Yeah. Okay. Right. Right. Good. So uh, then, then you have multiple... multiple yeah. What would that find? Which one? I, I, first of all, uh, if the game decomposes into disjoint things, only then you can have one player who gets always 100. Yeah. Okay. But that's besides the point. I don't even want to decompose it. OK, because that's like a okay. small trick. OK, but everything will work out with this. Uh, let, let's, let's talk later. But, but, but may, I think it's a, uh, sorry, I, I was wrong. It's not a. An, a I said it's not a well posed. No, it's not a not a well posed problem. So it is a well posed problem, but but it has an easy answer. Let's let's come to that. Yeah. Okay. So what else can we do? Well, so what we can do is equitable core imputations. What are these? So it's let's define the spread of a core imputation to be the difference between the maximum profit and the minimum profit and try to minimize the spread, the difference between the maximum profit of an, L of an agent and the minimum. And of course, here again, the minimum, we can only do it, uh, we, we, we only need to do, do these over essential players. Otherwise, we can run into the same problems as before and no need to go there two times. <laughs> OK, not for this audience, at least. So, And there's a big, fat LP that does it, but no need to go there either. OK. so. Chibli Shubik is great. Everybody agrees to that. Okay, and it has even more properties than than we sort of thought of. I don't know if you think of these as good or not, or there's more work to be done. All of those are valid questions. But the big question is going forward: what makes this theorem tick? Right? Why does this theorem have so much power? The Chibli Shubik theorem. Okay, and the reason is. Exactly what I've been saying so far, that this LP, first of all, it is polynomial sized. It's not like Shapley Shubik. Oh, no, Bondareva Shapley. And secondly, it always has an integral optimal solution. So for instance, suppose you are given this bipartite graph on four uh, teams and four players, and every team's profit is $1, then you could be matching half of this player to half of this, half of this to half of this, and so on, and therefore getting a total profit of two. But if there is such a matching, which, which is a fractional matching, then there's also one matching that matches these two players only, or these two players only. So this is an integral matching. And that always holds in a bipartite graph. There's always an integral optimal matching. OK. And that's great, because of course we don't want to cut up the players and send half of the player here and half of the player there, right? That will not be fair. <laughs> or maybe not even legal, sorry. So. Uh, so the answer is integrality. Okay, great. And as soon as we go to non-bipartite graphs, uh, unit weight edges over a triangle, then the optimal fractional matching is half, 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 which is one and a half. Optimal integral matching is strictly smaller. The core of this game is empty. And one way to repair it using 
notions from approximation algorithms for NP hard problems is to come up with a two third approximate core imputation. Always works. And why did I say NP hard problems in red? Any? Yeah. Oh, three minutes. No, no. <laughs> okay. Okay. Because 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 there's nothing NP hard here. Okay. So so the underlying reason for NP is uh, for integrality is. Integrality means that all vertices are integral of the, of the polytope, okay? And the underlying reason for integrality is total unimodularity of the constraint matrix, okay? And by Kramer's rule, it gives integrality. And can we generalize this? So some people got to this answer already, but they didn't generalize it all the way. And then there's, there's more to be done, namely or the B can also be an integral vector. And so, so B matching also works out. And then, but can we go even further? And there's a beautiful theorem from uh, 56 of Hoffman and Kruskal giving a necessary and con sufficient condition for integrality based on total unimodularity. And that gave me this game, uh, which is a much more general version, um, much more general than the housing game. And here the edge variables can be, uh, it can be used for many, many applications. Um, not many, 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 but maybe one or two school choice and uh, doctors and uh, and and uh, and there the edges can help enforce diversity and avoid mis over representation and then uh, there must be other totally unimodular games because i've only looked at matching which is zero one and that comes to flow games where which was given actually by kalai and zemel uh, where they only gave one core imputation and then one can get more core imputations because that's important because you can get fair core imputations very easily and this has many, many applications. Maxflow has many, many applications. Can we go even further? Yes, we can go even further. So we have come to the edge of total unimodularity. Can we go, go even further? Yes, we can go to total dual integrality. And this is where I really want to spend a minute. So, so I gave uh, something that I call the investment management game. Um, and uh, it is uh, defined over perfect graphs for which Finding a max weight independent set is in P, believe it or not. That's NP hard in general. Okay, and uh, and this is not a a, a a cooperative game at all. It's a game against nature. Okay, and this investment management game will not help anybody, you know, uh, do anything good about their investment. In fact, if you use it, uh, you're bound to run into big losses. So don't ever go there. But the reason for this game is that it shows the versatility of the notion of core, because so far the core was only used for profit and cost sharing and utility sharing. And that's not good enough for such a big, beautiful concept. It should have more diverse applications. And that was the reason for this paper. And uh, Nash equilibrium, which is certainly a much more important solution concept than core, maybe core is the second most important, has huge versatility. If you just look at bimetrics games, you know, Prisoner's Dilemma, Matching Pennies, um, Battle of Sexes, Rock, Paper, Scissor, everyone has a different meaning, okay? And beyond that. So why is it that code is stuck only on these uh, profit sharing and cost sharing? That was the reason to do this. And, and I told you that the code was defined by Edgeworth, taken to cooperative games in, in general equilibrium theory, then taken to cooperative games by Giles. And then the question is, does it want to go somewhere else? Because this is not a cooperative game at all. And it's definitely an application of the notion of core. So I don't know where it wants to go. I don't even know if, if anybody believes in what I've done, because there's no applications of uh, these investment. You, you certainly don't want to go near that if you're anywhere close to Wall Street. Um, and uh, I don't know how many people have uh, the cycles to spend on such a far out thing. But I hope it goes somewhere. I don't know. Okay, that's all. Thank you. We have one more question. Yeah. A quick question is possible. Okay. I'll get rid of this.